From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on November 6th, 2023. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome again to our Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin of the Biology Department at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 15th episode of Matters Microbial. I am really trying to think of something special for the 20th episode to thank listeners and viewers. This podcast has really been a dream come true for me. Now, The last episode of Matters Microbial was the day before Halloween. How did I dress up for Halloween? Well, at Vincent Racaniello's request, I was the microbe whisperer, as you can see. Now, today's denizen of my Wunderkammer is next. Here is a lovely collection of ammonite fossils from my collection of fossils. These beautiful cephalopods lived about 80 million years ago, some much older. I'll put a link to their natural history in the show notes. Next up are today's inspirational lapel pins. The first pin, about measuring your own progress not compared to others, but to yourself, is so important for everyone, not just students. Second pin is something I very deeply believe in all seriousness, that science is for everyone. Different faces and different voices truly do matter. Um, On a lighter note, I received an interesting comment uh, on the YouTube version of this podcast that a viewer liked my eccentricity. Now, as you might guess, I've heard that a lot over the years, and I see it as a compliment, which the commenter intended, I'm sure. And I must underscore how important it is to be oneself. Many years ago, I was mentored by the late, great Dr. Abigail Salyers, a photograph or a drawing you can see here. You simply must read her biography, linked in the show notes. Abigail was truly a force of microbial nature. I used to call her Hurricane Abigail. My wife, Dr. Jennifer Quinn, made this wonderful Lux portrait of her some years ago in Bioluminescent Bacteria. Abigail was truly a microbial hero to me. When I needed to find a new academic job, someone who I knew thought well of me suggested I become just a little bit less markish. I talked about Abigail about that, and she would have none of it. And she used less than polite language, as was her style. She insisted that authenticity truly mattered and that my voice in particular mattered in microbiology. Her lesson, one that I'm sharing with you, is that you should always be yourself, as you can see in this pen. I have really followed this advice over the years. I hope you'll take the time to read the blog post I wrote about Abigail some years ago about that incident. I posted that in the show notes. I really do miss Abigail, her energy, and her example. Now, a few episodes ago, I remarked on how the public tended to view microbes. First, as devil microbes, as this cartoon demonstrates, always up to no good. Then, as angel microbes, as the cartoon demonstrates, that are always doing good things. But the fact of the matter, sad but true, is that most microbes could care less about us. They are truly the meh microbes of this cartoon. But what about the microbes that have evolved with us along our evolutionary path? Can we learn from them? What lessons do they have for us? I have posted links to a couple of short review papers and a couple of videos for beginning micronauts. There's a great deal of press about the human microbiome. How do we tease out the truths of this very complicated situation. Well, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Sean Gibbons of the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington, to tell us about systems biology, 
the human microbiome, and how we all interact at all levels. Welcome to the Quality Quorum, Sean. It's so nice to see you. Thanks so much, Mark. It's a, it's a huge honor for me to be here. I've been watching the show. It's, it's great. Well, I'm glad you like it. Uh, the first question, if I may, is can you define systems biology for the listeners and viewers? Sure. I think you get a different opinion from every systems biologist if you ask them. But if you boil it down, I think it's something along the lines of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, there's this classic story of the blind men and the elephant, right? Everyone feeling a different part of the animal and saying, oh, it's a tree trunk or oh, it's a piece of paper. Um, and it's only by putting that information together that you can get this emergent view that they're actually all touching an elephant. Um, and I think that's that's the crux of it. You know, the 20th century was a lot about reductionist, reductionist science, zooming in a, into a small set of the system, like one protein or one pathway or one organism. But we know now that if you take that protein and you put it back into its native context or, or, or a non-native context, it's going to behave a lot differently than it did when you had it all by itself in a test tube. So systems biology is trying to reintegrate the complexity of the, of the system and understand how everything works in the context of that complexity. You know, even for an aged canid like myself, uh, this, this way of looking at the world has become available at a pretty reasonable price for research. We were looking at variants in bioluminescence, and we were able to have the initial organism and the one after a bunch of selections, and we could at one fell swoop compare the genomes to look for what's different and what's the same. I never could have dreamed of that a few years ago. As you say, we were so reductionist looking at one gene at a time. Totally. And people were so clever back in the old days with how they did experiments and how they, how they were able to see things with such limited tool sets. Now we're almost spoiled. We have these very cheap tools that give us gigabytes or even terabytes of, of data. Uh, so microbi microbiology or, or biology in general has become a sort of big data um, field. You almost have to be a computational biologist to have access the to that. This is my number one failing, is that I, I'm not good enough with that. And it's something I hope to address in the coming years as I begin to sunset from academia. Because I love looking at questions in science, so I hope to continue to do so. The, the second thing I'd like to ask, if you wouldn't mind, is can you define the microbiome? Sure. I mean, in the weeds of it, I think what the field is saying is that the microbiome is, is, is a term used to represent the sort of sequence data of all the taxa that are present in a given system, all the microbial taxa, uh, whereas the microbiota is ref referring to the actual cells that are there in the system. Um, but it's, yeah, the, all, all these organisms that are living in a given environment, a given biome, if you will, like the gut or the soil or, or the lake. Um, and there's a bunch of them and we can see them because if we boil them and have them spill their guts and like look at their nucleic acids, we can see who's there. And that's, that's what the microbiome is. So I think that's a good place to, to, to kind of put the listener or viewer in. Often the term microbiome is used in ways that make me cringe a certain degree, having to do with certain yogurts that are thought to have some wonderful medicinal effect. And there may be evidence in some ways of that, but it's awfully cavalier these days. So I look forward to hearing more ab about your research because I, I'm actually going to read this because you were quoted on the ISB website, and I so like this. And this is Dr. Sean Gibbons, not my words. We are moving islands inoculated at birth with a unique set of microbes that are integral to the functioning of our bodies. When the ecology of these microbial communities breaks down, so does our health. And what I like about that is it really does bring together uh, the issue of balance, the issue of complexity, and also particular topics that are really relevant to even the most casual of viewer or listener. So I've noticed that you've split up your website into several different areas that you work from, and I don't know if you had a plan of particular papers that you wanted to talk about or areas. Um, 
I, I have strong feelings, but let me hear what you would like to talk about. Yeah, I mean, so going back to what you just said, um, you know, overhyping the microbiome or, you know, what is the microbiome and all of this jazz? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we can't avoid the fact that we're living in a microbial world, as you well know, uh, as, as multicellular taxa. And, you know, you're either a happy meal for these bugs, right? They're either they're going to eat you up um, or, or you're going to find a way to coexist with them. Um, and, and that's what we figured out how to do, right? We've developed immune systems that allow us to put a barrier, even physical barriers like epithelial tissue, to put a barrier between us and, and the microbes. Um, but as we've gone in the field um, over time, we were learning more and more and more about how some of the functionality of our bodies has been outsourced to this complex community of alien taxa that aren't us. Uh, but the degree to that is, is different for different animals, right? There's a great paper, I think, from Noah Fuhrer's lab from a few years ago asking, you know, how important is the microbiome for an animal or for a, for a caterpillar? It tends to, the, the, the answer is actually, it's not, it's not important. They can live with it or without it. It really doesn't, doesn't hurt them to, to have, to be sterile. But if you're a cow and, and you suddenly nuke their microbiomes, well, they can't digest cellulose anymore and they're going to drop dead because they can't eat. Humans are somewhere in the middle, right? Um, we're kind of like, we're kind of like mice in a little bit. We're omnivores, so we can get calories even without our microbes. So we, we could probably survive for a while without microbes. Uh, it would, wouldn't be pretty. You know, if you look at mice, their, their organs are all malformed. Their immune systems are quite wonky. They're very susceptible to infection. So they don't live very well outside of a bubble. Um, and so I think that's, that's where we stand. We're somewhere in the middle between absolutely crucial to our day-to-day -day survival uh, and, you know, important for long-term health and wellness. And what our lab is focused on in the last few years is trying to slice into that question at the interface between the host and the microbiota by taking really dense, deep phenotypic molecular data on both the host and the microbiota. To look at the covariation of you know if something's changing in the blood, is that resonant with with changes in the microbiome? So the first quick story I'll I'll tell from from the lab just to get the conversation rolling is the first paper we published I think um, back in like 2019 I think we started in 2018 and uh, it, it was a it was a simple question so if you looked in the bloodstream could you use information about circulating markers in the blood? to predict something about the ecology of the microbiome in, in stool. And it turned out that you could. Um, circulating proteins in the blood weren't so good at telling you anything. Um, circulating um, uh, clinical laboratories, like clinical markers you can get at the dock, they weren't so good. But if you focused in on metabolites, small molecules, using untargeted metabolomics, uh, you could actually predict the ecological diversity of the microbiome through the bloodstream. You could see something about the microbiome in the blood, sort of like looking through a window pane with some Vaseline smeared over it. You know, there's such a degree of resonance between what's happening in the colon and in the bloodstream that you can actually predict something about the microbiome through the bloodstream. And that really tipped me off into like, this is super interesting and super important. And this isn't a matter of finding out what organisms are there. You're looking at the metabolic effects of those organisms reflected in the bloodstream. Exactly. And yeah, we followed I think that's up wonderful. That. Thank you. And, and we followed up that work um, last year where we did a more kind of detailed dissection, looking at the contribution of the host genome and the microbiome to the composition of the blood metabolome. And the microbiome beats the genome by a mile. I think the genome was able to explain something like a 10, 12, 13%. Uh, it was associated significantly with 10 to 13% of the metabolites in the bloodstream, whereas the microbiome uh, was associated with something like half of all, you know, detected metabolites that we had in our panel. Um, so almost half of all the metabolites circulating throughout your body, having distal effects on all the organs and systems of the body, they are being manipulated somehow by our microbes. You know, I was very influenced by um, Dr. Margaret McFall Nye when she would use some of the language that we are kind of 
swimming in a sea of microbes at all times. And I say that to students and they, you know, they, they either gasp or roll their eyes or it's, it's something that's seen as a negative. And this is something that these are old friends of ours. It, it's absolutely true that there are some microbes that do what you and I would perceive of as bad things, but the majority of microbes are they're fellow travelers down this evolutionary path with us. You, you know, I, I think you would get a big kick out of when I have students look at what kinds of bacteria can be found in their reusable water bottles. And they get really grossed out. And the horrible bit is, is that I said, there's no way you can truly clean that water bottle because you're the source. And they really are. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, we're three or four layers deep of microbes on our skin, and we're not going to stop holding hands with those we care for, right? Totally. Yeah, we're covered in them. And that's part, that's half the reason why, or you know, maybe more than half the reason why we're wearing protective gear in the lab is to protect our experiments from us because we're yes. a huge source of a contamination. <laughs> that's absolutely true. And this this runs into a little bit, uh, where were you going to, to go next? Or I might be anticipating what you're going to say next. So I'm going to let you go next. Well, I mean, just, I guess, you know, first I was struck by the degree to which, you know, this metabolic interplay is happening uh, through the blood, through, through the barrier of the gut into the bloodstream and back and forth. So there's all this crosstalk going on and we don't know, we don't have a Rosetta Stone to like decipher what's being said in this, this language, this metabolic language is being spoken between the microbes in our bodies. Um, but um, I had a feeling that it's, it's explaining a lot of the heterogeneity and variability that we see in how people respond to things, right? You, you take a drug, you eat an apple, you do this, you do that. Uh, some people go down this road, some people go down that road. And why we, we often don't have an explanation for it. Um, in clinical trials, there are always non-responders. You always see subsets of the population that just don't respond to your drug, or they have very different side effects than other people. Um, and the current model for for studying all of this doesn't doesn't you know it definitely doesn't focus on on those phenomena, right? How there are non-responders. Okay, great. Are there too many of them that it ablates your signal and you can't get a p-value that's significant and your trial doesn't go to the FDA and get approved? Then that drug fails. Uh, or or it was that enough people did respond that you got a p-value and you could push it through, but that obscures the fact that there's still a large proportion of people that, that are not responding to your drug. There's a short, I think is the name, a paper published, I think in 2015 in Nature, where they looked at the top grossing drugs on the market. And at best, only one in four people were um, had improved symptoms after taking a drug. And for the worst drugs of these top grossing, it was like one in 24 people actually showed clinical remission or improvement after taking the drug. So even these drugs that we trust and we see they, these brand names out there, many of them only work for a, a subset of the population and I, I want to rescue the non-responders. I want to know mm. why they're not and like, how do we fix that? And that's precision medicine, I guess. That, so that's, that's what I've been interested in really in the last uh, couple of years. I, I almost feel like, I mean, precision medicine is the correct term, but I almost want to call it personalized because of, you know, the old John Don, no man is an island, that kind of thing. Well, you, you know what? We are an amazing archipelago of things that are both us and otherwise. And I, when I teach about this, I often tell students the story of wood rats and creosote, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. And it's a very simplistic example where there's a particular microbe that can break down the toxins in creosote and how you can give that ability to other rodents or you can remove that ability by curing them. But the truth is far more complex. And I, I actually noticed you have... Um, a 2022 paper that is really relevant to this. Um, the title is Heterogeneity in Statin Responses Explained by Variation in the Human Gut Microbiome. And as a person who takes a statin drug, I'm interested. Yeah. So that's that was one of the areas we first looked at. Uh, be, as a matter of convenience, actually, um, we happen to have access to a large data set of something like 5,000 people 
where we had paired data on microbiomes and clinical records and you know blood measures and all this kind of stuff. So really rich, really, really nice data set. It's called the Aravel cohort. And it wasn't focusing on a particular population who were sick or you know, anything like that. It was, it was a healthy population by and large, you know, although there were people who were unhealthy within it, uh, but it was sort of a random sampling. And if you randomly sample the American population, you're going to get a lot of people like yourself who are taking statins. I think it's like, it's a very high number. I don't know if it's 20% of everyone over 40 is taking a statin, but it's something along those lines in the United States. I think it's the most prescribed drug on on earth, also if I'm not mistaken. So in this data set, we happen to have a lot of people who are taking statins and we could look at that in the context of the microbiome. Um, we also had the genomes for these folks. And so there are markers known to affect the efficacy of statins um, from the genome. And so we could pull those down and we could explain the heterogeneity that we could with the genome. And then whatever was left was the unexplained variation. And then the microbiome came in. We, we took that, looked at it. And um, overall, the microbiome actually explained more of the variability in statin responses than the genome did. Um, a little bit more. They were, they were kind of on par. So if you added them together, you, you, you actually can explain quite a lot of the variation. And it turned out that people who had an enrichment in the relative abundance of this genus Bacteroides, they had a really strong on-target effect for the statin, which is bringing down your LDL cholesterol. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, statins inhibit the enzyme and the rate limiting step of cholesterol synthesis in the, in the human liver called HMG-CoA reductase. Um, and so they slow that enzyme down and, and thus bring down the level of cholesterol in the body and LDL comes down. Um, and so people with high bacteroides show the biggest drop in their LDL cholesterol upon taking statins. But those same people had the, had the strongest side effects. So the side effect we focused in on was metabolic perturbation. So statins are known to increase your risk for type 2 diabetes or progression towards um, exacerbations of diabetes. So it kind of messes with your metabolism a little bit. It's, it's not a super, super strong effect. I think you're about twice as likely to develop diabetes while on a statin. So it increases your risk about twofold. Um, and we see that people's markers of insulin resistance jump up when they go on the statins. And the people with the bacteroides enriched microbiomes, it jumped up the most. So they had a big mm -hmm. metabolic perturbation in addition to their LDL lowering. However, the group that was more enriched in um, kind of clostridia from acuities type taxa, those folks seem to be somewhat protected from the metabolic side effects. Also, Acromantia mucinophila, that this bug was elevated. These folks seem to have a barrier that was protecting them a little from, from the side effects. Even though they were getting a significant LDL lowering, they weren't seeing this metabolic perturbation. And so based on that, that suggests, you know, co-therapies, right? You could use a probiotic to maybe protect people from the side effect of a statin or maybe another sort of prebiotic or some other therapy to boost the on-target effect of a statin. Probiotics are available at the store, right? You walk into the, the grocery store and you see a bunch on the shelf. Um, I remember when I was in my PhD with Jack Gilbert uh, that um, he went and sequenced a bunch of them and saw that only about half of them were actually the bugs that were on the label. <laughs> so there are some quality control issues with commercial probiotics. It's a fairly unregulated market. You know, safety is the main game there. As long as you're not um, causing trouble or hurting people, you know, it's a food item. It's considered a food item. So the claims about helping you, helping, helping your health can be very broad and general. Like it, it improves, you know, wellness, whatever that means. They can say things like that on the label, but they can't say this will cure your diabetes or this will cure your cancer or something like that. Um, so they are prohibited from making specific claims. However, you know, and, and I will say like some of them do work. There are clinical trials for some of these probiotics that have been deployed for specific things like traveler's diarrhea is a good example where they, you know, a lot of them do work fairly well. Um, and some of them have non-responders and responders, just like we've been discussing, you know, they might work really well for a subpopulation and not for another. And we don't quite understand why. Uh, so that's it. That's a problem with probiotics just as much as it is for drugs. I would say, um, What's coming in the near future is a very exciting with next generation probiotics. So the ones that we have available now, they're just in food, right? They're grandfathered in because they are already in sauerkraut or 
yogurt or all these things we've been consuming for thousands of years, but they're not actually the bugs that are dominant and abundant in the adult gut. Those bugs are now finally becoming approved to be given to people. They've gone through, say, say phase one safety trials to show that they're safe, um, even though we're all carrying them around right now. So they're obviously safe. But still, if you take it out of person and give it back to them, you have to prove that it's safe. Um, but I think these organisms, um, companies like Pendulum, for example, are selling these types of bugs, uh, are probably going to be more efficacious and, um, and have a bigger impact than the old ones. Have, have you seen the Z-Biotics people, Sean? Z-Biotics? I don't think so. You're going to love it. Uh, they've taken a B-subtilis strain that's GRAS, and they have put aldehyde dehydrogenase into it, oh. and they're selling it as a hangover cure. <laughs> I, think, I think I did hear about that. Yeah. I didn't know the name yeah. of it. That's well, great. you know, I bought some just to see if I could streak out anything. Nothing grows on my plates. <laughs> so there you go. Quality control. Yeah, yes. we need, we're in a weird no man's land where, you know, the FDA approved um, bugs as drugs, right? Uh, those require a huge amount of money and investment to get them through the phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, billions of dollars. And then when they when they get approved, they want to sell them for like $30,000 a dose, right? But no one's going to walk into the grocery store and buy a $30,000 probiotic. So we, you know, if we made pro probiotics, you know, if we, if we made regulated them like we did drugs, they would be vastly more expensive. So it is like a trade-off between cost and, and quality control regulation. I do think some companies are better than others in this space, and hopefully the consumers will, will reward the ones who are doing it well and punish the ones that are not. There weren't really like high effect size efficacious probiotics on the market until companies like Pendulum have come out. And I think that company really is sucking up a lot of the market space now from other probiotic companies. And it's because they've done trials. They, like, for example, their one probiotic cocktail decreases markers of prediabetes in a placebo-controlled randomized trial. So like, they have proof that they're, they work, even though they're not regulated as drugs, they at least have done some of the science to prove that there's an effect for a specific indication. But this is what I worry about, because just as we've tried to move away from reductionism, we can't come back to reductionism with the idea of one organism being responsible for good things. It's, as you've been saying, likely in a series of interactions. Totally. And I think uh, if, if I'm being honest, you know, I, I'm selling this idea of precision medicine, but <clears throat> there are interventions that pro work pretty well for like 60, 70 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. And it's only that subset that really require the more precision part of it. And I think that's usually the, it's something like that. Often the split, when you find a good drug, it does work OK in maybe half of people. Um, and then you, you have to think harder about the other half. Um, I th so, yeah, maybe one bug I, I will work. For certain applications, right? But but not for, some for everybody. People. Yeah. Right. I mean, one of the things about this that occurs to me is that when we do studies on rodents, they're practically monomorphic. <laughs> They've been so inbred. So and because we want their responses to be the same, but that's not the case with humans. And that's just the genetic side of it without the microbiological side of it. So it, it isn't necessarily a surprise that you're going to have a lot of variation based on this. I did have a question for you, though, if you wouldn't mind. I um, seem to remember reading somewhere there's some evidence of the microbiome's association with the effectiveness of certain cancer chemo, chemo, <laughs> chemotherapy drugs. Is, is, am I misremembering? No, you're not misremembering. That is true. There, there are a couple of papers on this. I can't think of the citations off the top of my head, yeah. but yes, that has been been found. Um, there's very recent work looking at fecal transplants and cancer immunotherapy. <clears throat> so there is evidence now that that they can affect the outcomes. They can essentially turn some non-responders to immunotherapy into responders through through FMT. Um, I think that. This is just such a rich field that's going to blossom in the next ten to twenty years, uh, where we're going to really, yeah, the, the we're going to be able to cash the check um, for all of this precision medicine in the microbiome. It's taking time because I think a huge challenge is how do you translate 
taxonomy into sort of the functional output that you're interested in that's relevant to the disease phenotype. And that's been hard to, to do in high throughput. Um, but I think we're getting there. It's, it's interesting. If, if you were to think about studying an ecosystem, what we tend to do is take tallies of what we observe. We, we don't just take a big chunk of it and analyze whatever's there. And, 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 and that's what we have to fight against. We have to remember that everything's interacting all the time. And uh, I, I have forgotten the number, perhaps you have it in your hard drive between your ears, about the concentration of microbes in the gut. Is it 10 to the 11th per gram? That's correct. I think in stool, it's 10 to the 11th per gram. Yeah. So pretty much it's it's got more, a denser population, a more variable population than pretty much any ecosystem on the planet sitting as, as we're sitting there eating popcorn or, or things that we should, well, maybe we should be eating popcorn. That's the other part. But I, I suspect that there's not one solution, but a series of solutions, uh, a spectrum, as you, if you will, of solutions for things. And it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's going to take the, the development of new types of tools um, to just to brush on that really briefly. We have a couple of preprints that are out now that are the, the beginning proofs of concept for uh, um, these microbial community scale metabolic models that we're trying to build. So essentially a, a digital twin of your gut, if, if you will, that you can boot up in silico and, you know, I can you know, put all the bugs in their abundances that are, that are in my particular gut and I can put the background diet as to like, you know, what I usually eat. And then you just change things. You add a banana, you add a tangerine or a piece of meat and see what comes out the other end as far as metabolites go. And, you know, a lot of people have tried this before and you know, it's all well and good to build models, uh, but if you know they're not accurate, they're not accurate. So the, the preprints are about showing that we can predict things accurately for a, a few use cases. One is short chain fatty acid production. So it appears that we can produce, we, we, can, we can predict personalized short chain fatty acid profiles for a given input, like a banana, for example. You give you feed 10 people banana, different SEFA profiles come out the other end. And it seems that we can get a handle on that with these, these types of models um, and engraftment. So it seems like we're, we're doing okay with predicting um, the engraftment of particular bugs in a, in, a, in a system, right? If you throw something in, does it stick or does it not stick? And we think we have a bit of a handle on that now too. But it's, it's having these types of tools, these modeling tools that will enable um, the personalization of some of this. And, you know, I'm so old fashioned because of my own training and when I received it, I'm, I'm, I'm reminds me when people were first studying biofilms and they would look at one bacterium and then I would reasonably point out that that's not how biofilms exist. So they'd use two, which isn't how it works either. But how do you look at the complexity of things? Well, now you have tools where you can, and it makes sense that it would be that complex and is a really exciting time to do this work. Totally. I agree. So can I, can I take a little bit of a break? Could you say a few words for the listeners and viewers about your path to science? Because I know it's an, it's an unusual one. Sure. Yeah. I, I grew up in, um, on a, um, Native American reservation in Montana. Um, and so yeah, kind of very rural childhood surrounded by a lot of beautiful nature. That's probably why I wanted to become an ecologist and, um, yeah, maybe I'm going back too far, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as a kid, I was super interested in like arcane, invisible things and magic and da, 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 da. Right. So that, that, that was my initial interest. And then I kind of realized, oh, well, magic maybe isn't so real. So how, what about, what about what's real? Right. And then science seemed to be grown up magic. Uh, so I kind of, I was pulled towards, towards science as a way to interrogate and understand the sort of unseen, the, the world around us that we that's, that's there, that's mysterious, that's, that's powerful, um, that we can have access to through, through a, a method that's called the scientific method. And so that, that pulled me into science, but I had very broad interests. I was, uh, my bachelor's degrees are in French literature, <clears throat> uh, molecular biology and um, microbiology. So I was maybe going to study French literature uh, or science. I had, a, I had a choice to do both at the end of my undergrad, and I, I ended up choosing science and the rest is history. 
I, I really believe that people who come from different kinds of backgrounds, it's like their brains haven't been canalized into what the right approach is. Um, students make, they actually, well, they do make fun of me about this. When someone doesn't know the answer to a question, I find that exciting. And, and, you know, my eyes light up. That's what they, that's what they say to me. And yeah, because that's what I've always loved about science, you know, because we have a series of tools to investigate things to, uh, I'm with you about the magic thing. If magic were reproducible, I'd be right in there as a wizard. Okay. So would you, right? Oh yeah. I even have an, I even have an elder wand. I'm all set. Okay. But the point is, this is, if you don't mind my saying so magic that works in a way, and we can make these predictions and especially what you're doing can benefit other people. I, I also noticed that you had, and I don't know if this is next on your list to chat about, um, but this, uh, well, I don't know, it's from Nature Metabolism 2021, Gut Microbiome Pattern Reflects Healthy Aging and Predicts Survival in Humans. I promise you that gains a lot of interest. <laughs> oh, it has. It has for sure. That is one of the, yeah, has gotten the most media coverage, I think, of anything that we've published in the last couple of years. Yeah. And it, it goes back to this idea of responders and non-responders, I would say. Um, you know, why do some people live well into their old age and they're still running around and super healthy and, and full of, full of vim and vigor and others aren't, um, you know, it's not all about lifestyle. I mean, it's a lot about lifestyle. You know, if you exercise and you eat a plant-based diet, you're going to extend your lifespan on average, I would say, but there, there is a little more to it. And, um, so we looked into this literature. So we, like I said, we had this cohort of really deeply characterized people, a few thousand, and they spanned a range of ages between, you know, 18 years old up through 90. And so we thought we could try to look at this question of aging in the microbiome because in the literature, there was actually a little bit of a disconnect. You know, some groups were reporting one signature in centenarians, these very healthy older people where their microbiomes are kind of changing over time as they get older, um, that you're seeing that the core taxa that tend to dominate our guts when we're younger are declining in prevalence. And these subdominant taxa that aren't usually there in high prevalence or high, high relative abundance, they're increasing in their dominance. Um, and this is associated with, with increasing age in these centenarians. However, in um, people in assisted living facilities, maybe uh, have worse or health, they are showing kind of a main maintenance of the core taxa of youth. Um, and then like a, a precipitous decline towards the end of life where they kind of, everything kind of crashes. Uh, and so we thought, well, maybe, maybe this is a, um, a health signature. Maybe, maybe if you were able to partition the population by health, you would be able to see these patterns sort of emerge on both sides. And that is exactly what we saw. So if we took this population, we had two different, pop we had actually three populations. We used the American gut. We use this Arabelle population I talked about before. And then we had another population of older men called the Mr. Oss cohort that was originally recruited to study osteoporosis in men, a thousand older men between like, you know, 80 and a hundred years old. And we had health data on these older men. And so we could, we had different ways of cal calculating health. Walking speed is one. If you can walk fast when you're older, you're, you're healthier. Um, uh, drug use and self-reported health and a few others. And no matter how you quantified health, if you took the healthier people, put them over here and the less healthy people put them over there, you see what the centenarians show in the healthy folks. There's this drift. Their microbiomes are becoming increasingly different and unique with time as these core tax are declining and all the bugs that make each individual an individual are increasing in prevalence. So we saw that same signature in the healthy people. And in the less healthy people, we saw this, you know, holding on to the core bacterides essentially from youth. Um, and then the kicker of the, of the analysis is that we had follow-up data on this Mr. Oss cohort for survival. And we found that if we partition people at their baseline time point for the kind of healthy versus unhealthy microbiome signature, uh, those with the healthy signature were you know, much more likely to survive to follow up. So it was, it was predicting sort of survival. Wow. Well, that's really exciting. Um, yeah, I believe this whole idea. I mean, this idea of the the gut 
micro, they used to use the term microflora. I know you're not supposed to say that, but you know the idea. There were some Russians that really believed that that's what controlled aging clear back in the 1920s. And, and I, I always thought that was an amazingly simple sounding idea, but there might be an echo of it in what you're seeing. Yeah. And we're following up on it and, you know, it's, it's difficult to parse apart, but it does look like some of these Bacteroides species are facultative mucus degraders. So if you aren't eating enough dietary fiber, they start eating you. And as we age, you know, our mucus layer is, is thinning because we're not producing as much mucus as we age. And so I'm, I'm guessing maybe that maintaining high levels of these facultative mucus degraders might not be good for that barrier integrity. And then in the people who are aging healthily, you actually see a kind of increasing prevalence of these clostridia, butyrate producers, and bugs like acromancia. And it seems like having higher levels of those taxa in older age um, is associated with a benefit. And these, these bugs have also been associated with like improved metabolic health, like less likely to develop diabetes, for example. And that could be also helping to maintain health in, in later stages of life. So what amazes me is you have these different types of research that you're doing within your group that you share with, and, and yet you find all these common threads that work together. And it's, it's been wonderful to hear about. Um, first off, do you have any shout outs for your colleagues? I mean, the folks that are working within the group that you had? Oh, of course. I mean, the, all the Aravel cohort stuff and the aging stuff done with really close colleagues here at ISB, uh, Nathan Price, um, who was an associate professor here. Now he's uh, the chief science officer for Thorne Health Tech. So you kind of moved to industry. Um, Nitin Baliga, who's my neighbor, Lee Hood, um, really generous, um, more senior faculty here who have shared their resources and their data sets to, to help me get off the ground. Um, and then, you know, Eric Orwall, who had access to this Mr. Ross cohort. Um, there's too many people, honestly, to thank. When you, when you do work across many you know, fields and disciplines and like to think broadly that your bread and butter is being good at making a lot of friends and communicating well across different people from different, different backgrounds. This is a theme that we've heard several times on the podcast about the, if I'm used to the old school idea of like one person in the lab, say in the 1950s, but it really has turned into more of a group kind group work approach to things and that's an interesting parallel to what we know about the microbiome as well. You have lots of different microbes working together for a particular common goal. Same thing for a research lab. Totally. The, the, the last thing I'd like to ask you, and I, I do this with everybody that's kind enough to come on this, this podcast, is what was the one incident that sold you on being a microbiologist? I mean, we know that you couldn't be a magician. We know you're interested in ecology in general. It's a tough question, Mark, uh, and it's a good one. I'm glad you asked this of people. I, I would say there's, there's many moments, but I do have a very vivid memory in the first grade where the teacher explained to us what an atom was and that everything was composed of them, but they were invisible, but they were the foundation of all matter. And it just, at, at, for whatever reason, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It blew my mind. And I was drawing atoms and like trying to like, imagine down to that scale and that kind of opened me up to this this mysterious world that was maybe accessible through science um and then microbes i don't know microbes are are, are just amazing right they're they're they are invisible so they fit fit my my penchant for the uh, arcane invisible things that are out there that you that are running the world that you can't see and you have to try to figure out um, so they're in that camp, um, but they're also complex biological entities that can do anything, essentially. Uh, so their ca capacities are, are immense. There's just an infinite playground of the types of questions and, and things you can study with microbes and what they're associated with. So it's it's been, yeah, it's been the playground of my life. Well, my first tattoo is Awite Pawele Domini, I'll hail the small masters. That should tell you something right there. And, and I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you again for coming on the podcast. And I, I, should, I should come up to Seattle and visit. Yeah, let's get some tiki drinks. <laughs> you know too much about me.
<laughs> well, in any event, uh, I really appreciate your time. I found this to be fascinating, and I hope our listeners and viewers do as well. Please give my very, very best to your colleagues and your friends. I will. Thank you. Thank you again. And then I do the, the outro. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with truly wonderful links as always, can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Sean Gibbons can be found at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum for today. See you next week on Matters Microbial.